Sam here from Eggsies and welcome to a quick woodworking tutorial on how to make a bench hook. The bench hook looks like this and it's used for hooking on a bench and how to move a piece of wood up against it and hold it firm while she then saw it. It's an extremely handy tool because it means you can use your other hand to help guide it and it's not all about fighting against your body as you're using the saw. It helps cut a straighter line and if you put in different guides on it then you can help yourself cut different angles as well so you can turn it into a mitre bench hook. But we're just going to concentrate on a simple bench hook today. To get started making your own bench hook what you're going to need is a piece of wood that is roughly flat. Now we want to make sure it's not curved too much we want it to be as flat as it can. Right now it's particularly dry out so what we've noticed is wood is drying and it's slightly curving in the heat but as flat as you possibly can. I'm going to make two so I found a bit of off cut which I'm going to chop in half and I'm going to make two out of this. So we've got our base piece of wood. What we also need is some ends, some stop ends on it that will go on the ends. Now these can either be as long as the wood or like in this case it could be shorter than the wood. Now this depends on where you're going to be doing your sawing afterwards. If you're going to be sawing on a nice table or somewhere that could get damaged then what we suggest is you have a shorter stop end so that you can use the wood as a guide and if you accidentally saw through it you're only damaging the wood on the bottom of the bench hook. If you're working on a workbench or you can overhang your wood that you're cutting over the edge of the table then we say that you can cut your stop end as wide as the piece of wood you're using. What you also need is a standard saw. Now this is a cross cutting saw or if you haven't got a standard saw you might have yourself a tenon saw and this will be for more accurate cuts. You also need yourself a tape measure you're going to need yourself some screws. Now these screws need to make sure that they're not going to go through the wood and stick out the other side because you don't want the pointy bit sticking out especially if you run your hands over it, it can, you can catch it. So you need to make sure your screws are the right size for the materials you're using. I've gone for size 4mm by 14mm so that's 4mm across the thread and it's 40mm in total length. It's preferable, if you can, to have yourself a drill with a drill bit which is just below the size of your screws. So I told you I had four millimeter screws. I've gone for a three and a half mil drill bit and I'm gonna be using that to make small little holes in these stop ends so that when I screw it down to the wood, it's less likely to split. So you might have a drill and you might have the screwdriver attachment for it or you might have yourself an impact driver with a screwdriver attachment to it. So we've got our materials and a pencil for marking. Now, I've got my piece of wood. I want to know roughly where halfway is in that piece of wood. So it's 52, halfway is 26. If I'm going to draw a line across this piece of wood to make sure I cut in a straight line, I've got a few ways to do it. One, if I know this end is flat, I can measure the same amount and mark it on one side, then the other side, and in the middle. And then put something that connects all those three dots up across that piece of wood. So I could use this. I've got my three marks there. And I could draw a line that way. So what else I could use within the materials that I've got with me is on a saw we've got a 90 degree angle which means when I have that plastic handle right up against that edge of that wood this line going across is at 90 degrees to the side that's a very handy thing about a saw if I wanted a 45 degree angle then this part of the saw is set at 45 and so I have it flat against the side and I could draw a 45 degree angle across that piece of wood. I don't need that today. 
I just need the 90 degree and then I'd mark it. So when I'm doing this, I'm making sure the plastic handle is right up against it. And it's not about just connecting up the dots with the edge of the saw. Now, I might want to just check that. I might then turn it over the other way and bring it back down to the line. Bring it to my mark and go over. I'm happy with that. Just want to check it from the other side of the wood. So all of those three lines overlap. You might think that's silly. Why are you checking it three times? But if I don't check it and I cut it wrong, I can't stick that wood back together. So checking it twice or even thrice will mean that I save that piece of wood from just going in the waste pile. Now, I've got my line here. I'm gonna put it up against my other bench hook I've made. Now, if you haven't already got a bench hook to make another one, what you could be using is a clamp and you could clamp that piece of wood over the edge of a table, run the clamp on it and then tighten the handle up until it doesn't move. Now that's going to make for an accurate cut as well, but you might think, oh, you know what, I can hold it whilst I saw it. But what might happen is it moves a little bit and then you're sawing it and it might then go off as a, as a wonky line. So you might end up with one good bit of wood and another bit of wood you're going to have to throw away. Another one, you might want to get your body involved and hold a bit more weight down and you might be able to saw it that way. But having a bench hook is so much easier. So with a bench hook, I can either have it so the wood's overhanging the edge, which means I have to be careful not to hit the table. I can have it so it's running over the wood, so the wood acts as a little bit of a guide to let me know when I'm getting down to the table, but I'd have to change the angle at which I'm cutting. And that's particularly good with a tenon saw because you are cutting flat, you're not cutting at an angle. What I prefer to do is cut over an edge of a table. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm making sure when I'm doing this, my thumb is not going across the line and no fingers are underneath and I don't want to accidentally cut it because this is a sharp saw. So I'm just pushing the wood against the black back block. Put my finger up against that saw as I'm guiding it into my first cuts until I know it's in. I'm using the whole length of the saw to do this. What you notice is my arm is able to move freely backwards into my body and I'm standing with one leg forwards and one leg back. On my saw hands, I've got my finger pointing forwards and I've got a grip in. I just find that makes me have a more accurate and a more comfortable grip. I'm not pushing particularly hard at all. Sawdust is building up on that line. I'm just gonna blow it away and continue. If I didn't blow it away, I might start going off of my line and making a bad cut. gentle at the end because what I don't want to do is rip this off and make a splinter down the wood. So now I've got myself two bits of wood roughly in half, one up there for later. I've got a few bits of rough edges on this so I have to have some sandpaper on the table. So now we're going to move on to the 
stop ends of the bench hook. I'm going to make a mark. These have already got cuts on them, so I'm going to have to cut these twice. I'm going to make a mark and I'm going to cut that bit off. Now I could measure, or I could use the fact that the piece of wood, I could draw a line up the edge, or I could have done it this way. Now I know one size, I can use that to mark up the other one. So now I've got my two pieces, I'm going to pilot hole which means I'm going to draw a small hole on either end about, about the length between my thumb and its first knuckle so just a few centimetres in I'm going to do this over a gap in the table What I'm also going to do is I'm going to put a hole in the middle of the wood Just as the moisture will get into this, I can help bend some of that wood back. So to affix these to the wood, you've got some options. If you're just going for a quick option, you might just want to use screws for the pilot holes, screw them down into that piece of wood. However, if you want it to be more long lasting, what you might want to do is run a bead or a line of glue on there. And you can rub it across, make sure you've not got rid of all the sharp bits from the drill. And again, you put a bead or a line of glue again on this piece of wood. So you can use the standard PVA glue. I'm doing there is just making sure again I've got the wood in a straight line going across the wood so when I'm cutting I know I'm cutting at a nice 90 degree angle so now I've got that piece of wood in position it's sitting down on the glue I can't sit there and hold it for a long time to do that so what I'm now going to do is put a few screws in I'm going to do this gently I need to hold down that piece of wood What I had there is a gentle curve in this piece of wood because it's really dry and what I've been doing is gently slowly moving that screw in as it then closes that gap back up. I don't want to do that fast because what that would do is put a split down the wood. What I could do after and all of this is dried I might put it in some water and then just tighten those screws a little bit more and if the glue hasn't stuck I might reattach the glue and then tighten it back up. 
Now when I want to attach the other side, it's not literally the other side, I've got to turn it over. Now normally you would pour out a little bit of glue and then use that. Because it's particularly hot today, I just decided to dip my finger in. You can use a paintbrush as well or any bit of plastic. You can chop a bit of thin plastic off an old milk bottle, stick that in the glue container and use that to smear it out. So I've got it roughly in position. I'm going to get my first screw in. just want to make sure that I've got no glue that's just going to be sat on the piece of wood that I want. If I want to make a tighter fit I can also just smear a little bit of glue into that little gap on this side just to help it bond. But there is a simple bench hook. Now I'm going to quickly make up another one and I'm going to use this bench hook to make myself a little bee hotel so I hope you keep watching. The reason I like my bench hook so it goes over the whole piece of wood is I can use it left or right handed. So left handed I can saw this side, right handed I go this side. With this bench hook it was designed that one side is for right handed and the other side is for left handed. Notice when I was using the drill I didn't take my finger off the trigger, I drilled all the way through and I kept my finger on the trigger and I pulled it out gently against it. You don't flick it into reverse, you just keep it going in the same direction and you put it out. If you flick it into reverse, what you end up doing is undoing the, the chuck which is holding the drill bit and the drill bit might fall out. The other thing about using small drill bits, so if you've got a 3 or a 3.5mm drill bit, you've got to make sure that when you're drilling, you're drilling slowly and straight. If you're doing it, if you're doing it too fast and you put it off at an angle, you might heat up that drill bit and it might snap. If you're doing it straight and then suddenly you pull off at an angle, you might find you bend the drill bit. And again, that makes for bad holes or you end up with a drill bit left inside the wood.
now I have two bench hooks. Now I've got my bench hook made, I'm going to make myself a quick frame to turn into a bee hotel. Just checking I've got 80 centimetres because each one's going to be 20 centimetres thick but I'm going to mark each one up separately after I've cut the first one because what the people forget is the thickness of the blade is going to cut through that piece of wood so depending on where I've put my line and where I've measured from I might find that as I'm going along my pieces are getting just that slightly bit smaller and if I want to make a square I want them to be the same size so I'm going to start with one cut it measure the next one and cut it I got my position for the first. Let's just check this line. So this is a longer cut, but I'm now going to need to take my time and I'm going to have to work through it slowly, keeping to the line. Getting to the end now, I'm just going to hold that bit of wood. Four pieces. A bit of sandpaper. If I was worried about getting splinters or anything like that. So one trick with sandpaper is you can put it around the block and hold it by the block. It means you're less likely to get a splinter through the paper into your hands. Another little trick to know is a number on the back of the sandpaper will tell you how sharp and how much wood it will take off as you rub it across. The lower the number, so if it's a 20, a 40, an 80, a 120, a 240, the lower the number, the more wood it will rub off in one go, but the more marks and scratches will do it on it. So the finer the sanding you need, the higher the number you need to use. For this, all we're doing is taking off the rough bits of wood, so a 40 or an 80, absolutely fine. There's no point using a 240 grit on this because it will just take a lot longer to do. Now what I want to do is put them all together. So an easy way of doing this is to have them all with a drill hole on one end. So to get the drill hole here, I need to know I mark it on the inside just so it's not seen afterwards. Now the drill hole has to be roughly in the middle of these lines. Yay. I'm going to use three fixing points.
So now I'll be fixing one piece of wood onto an end of another piece of wood. So preferably, I want to have a back on this. Here I found an old bottom of a drawer. on the back on the bee home because the bees themselves don't want a hollow tube wind blowing through it and they're actually spending some of their energy sealing up the upper end of a tube or a hollow stem if it was open on both ends so I'm just trying to make it more comfortable for those leaf cutter bees and those mason bees so I can put the fibrous side down Get myself a hammer. Just little pin nails. So these are the sort of things you see on the back of a, an IKEA wardrobe or chest of drawers. A little flat top nail and a small little shaft of it. All I'm going to do is use some of these just to help secure it. Excellent, so now I've got myself a box. All is left to do is to fill it up with some hollow stems. Could be straw as well, could be bamboos. It could be any stem that could be eaten out. So you might have bamboo canes. Uh, you might have elderflower, they, the bees can hollow that out themselves. You might have other plants that you've noticed have created a hollow stem. The only one I suggest you do not use and do not collect from out in the wild is something called Japanese knotweed. If you do not know what it looks like, please look it up, it's an invasive species we should make sure that we shouldn't be digging it up, transplanting it or moving it around. So any other hollow stems will be absolutely fine, but make sure it's not Japanese knotweed, which does look a little bit bamboo-like to anyone who doesn't know what it is. So let's go get our hollow stems. I'm gonna have a hunt around the garden and come back in a minute. So here's a start of a tent. I've got some big old dry wood which has hollow centres. I found some old bramble which has got a central uh, soft pith which should be mined by the bees. I've got some younger stems which have some bigger holes. So anything between probably 6 and 12 millimetres will give a variation for the different kinds of bees that might use this kind of habitat. Um, if I was doing this freestanding and not with a back, what I would need to do is fill the back end up with something like wet mud and squish it in there and then poke that end in first. So as you can see, I'm just laying them inside.
was a little bit too long. I don't really want them overhanging. Is almost the finished product. I'm just going to need a few more things just to fill in here. What I might do is put something in like a straw material in there just to hold it all in place because I can get a tighter fit and it will hold all these sticks in place. And then the bees will be able to come down, land in, go all the way in the tunnel, lay their little eggs, fill that up with either leaf or mud, backfill it, and then they lay another egg. Then they fill it up again with mud, then they lay another egg. And so come spring, then they will hatch out you'll have a lot more extra solitary bees, which are amazing things for pollination. The final thing we need to consider is how we're going to fix it. Now I might put a wire through and hold it, hang it in a tree, or I might add myself a hook into the back side of it, and then I'll be able to hook it into the tree. now I'm just going to rest it up there. 